She's putting down. Oh, yo. Hot nights. Hot song. Hot fish. All night long. Hot fish. Yes. Hello and welcome to the best show around today called Sensational. And just make sure you're comfortable. You've never seen a show like this before. And we're so lucky to have with us today the author of Too Old to Be a Hooker and Too Young to Be a Man. And I, I do laugh at this. It's just a fabulous title. I chuckle every time. She's a wonderful lady. And like I said, we're so excited to have her here today. And Elisa, welcome. Mm. The author of Too Old to Be a Hooker, Too Young to Be a Madam is Elisa Eaton. Right. Mm. And I'm so glad that you're here today. I'm so glad I'm here because you're such fun. We're, we're, we're going to have a lot you're of fun. You're such an upper. <laughs> <laughs> and you're passionate about my work. I'm also, passionate about which I love. You're passionate about my trashy book. I'm passionate about it because I call it a romantic porno. There's, oh my God! Yeah, there's no book like this. No book. Completely. Different. Nobody's lived but, it. Yeah. Tell me, how did you get that title? Too old to be a hooker and too young to be a man. Of well, I was working on a set and I heard that Universal had a hooker call. And I was smart. I got cast in the movies as hookers because that's where all the money was. Right. And so I called up and I said, Hi, Ernie. It's Elisa. I hear you have a hooker call at Universal. Can I get on it? Oh, no. His name was Mr. Wang Dong. Pardon me. And so he said, Sorry, Elisa. You're too old to be a hooker and too young to be a madam. And that's how I got the titles. And they think it's about hookers and madams, but oh, there's some of that in there. Oh, what a title. And this is her book here. And you could get it in all the bookstores in town. Great cover. There she is sitting on her, uh, what is that, Mercedes or a Bentley? 1955 Bentley. Ah, the porno stars Bentley. Oh, it was a porno star's Bentley? Yes, it was. He was just too cheap to put gas in it. Oh, okay. That was the only problem. <laughs> so he drove his frog car. Oh, anyhow, Elisa, there's a lot to cover, and we only have a half hour. But uh, Elisa has all of these bizarre adventures back in the heyday in the Hollywood Hills, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, right? Fame, uh, champagne decadence. Uh, bisexuality, right? right? Betrayal? Right. Wow. Wow. That's hot. <laughs> betrayal is hot? <laughs> well, when you're, when you're hot, you get betrayal. Well, I when get... When you get hot with the wrong hottie. I guess you do. That's what happens. And they say, I, in your book, you have a lot of quirky, damaged, uh, self-absorbed, and the egos of all these quirky characters in your book, right? Uh-huh. You attract what you are. Well, you know, that's true. That's true. Uh -huh. I'm a little damaged and quirky, too. Well, I think all of us are a little bit damaged. You know, no one's perfect or anything like that. But your, your life is, uh, uh, I would say, like you said, from hell to heaven, right? Right. <laughs> All emotional, completely emotional. And sexual. And sexual. And speaking of sexual, I like Antonio in the book. Antonio, oh my God, my Latin from Madrid. What you, she mentioned that Antonio was a combination of a pit bull and a stallion. I like that he combination. He was a combination of a stallion and a pit bull. Well, did, which did you like the best? Georgia? Oh, I like both of them. You like both? Yeah. But tell Mainly us. the stallion. Uh -huh. He was from Madrid, uh -huh. and he was a wacko, just like all the, the other wackos. <laughs> and uh, some of the lines were, when I wouldn't speak to him, he, he, like I ran into him somewhere at Trader Joe's, believe it or not, and I, I was a food critic, and I was tasting, and he goes, Barbarella! 
are you still tasting? And I said, yes. And I pulled this out. His girlfriend was in line at the time. And he said, darling, I want your phone number. You disconnected it, right? And I looked at him and I said, I don't give my phone number to the devil. Fuck off. <laughs> oh, he, excuse me. I yeah, didn't yeah. say that word. F, F, F. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, excuse this, I know. I mean, excuse we're on the us. station here. That's I'm very it. bad. Oh, but uh, he did get your number. No, he didn't. I how got, did you connect with I him? I got his number. Well, he got it eventually before he wanted to wear my dress. And then, well, what happened was he was, I was always throwing him out. Um, once he called me and he wanted to move in him with, you know, on me. Uh -huh. And I had a shih tzu that slept on the bed, and he says, I don't want to sleep with Piggy on the bed. And I said, well, I like my Shih Tzu better than you, so <laughs> goodbye. So he called me up one night, and he said, darling, my princess, my sweetheart, I miss you, I love you. I dream with your red pusita and your big chichis. <laughs> And then when I saw him, you know. He was very colorful. No kidding. He, yeah. he was really well. Very colorful. And let me tell you, as long as, uh, no doubt he was really crazy about you, but I would say he did a lot of hopping from one to the other. I mean, as long as the two legs, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Boy or girl. And then what happened is I didn't know he was bisexual, which I love bisexual men because I'm a little bi. I'm a little, I've got a little sugar in my tank. Oh. I'm on hiatus right now, but oh. I mean, you know. Oh, okay. I love gay. Gay, oh. gay, gay, gay. Okay. I was so going to ask you a little bit later in the book, but you're coming about that oh, right, all right now and everything. So well, anyway, what good. happened with him was one night I was lying in bed drinking wine, and he was in my closet. We were going out somewhere, and he looked. He came out with my, wearing my red sequin dress, and he looked at me, and he said, Barbarella! I hope you won't take this the wrong way, my sweetheart. But I think that my red satin dress, the real red sequin dress, would look better on Antonio than you. By the way, I'm not gay. I had a cabaret, <laughs> cabaret act in Madrid, and I was Dietrich. And I looked at him and I said, oh, I can see that. Uh, he did that very well. And he was well. really crazy. He did that very well. So how long did you go with him? How long did it last? About a year and a half. About a year and a half. Now, after that was over, your Mambo King, which you call him, right? Right. Your Mambo King. Then Lance Lust. Lance Lust. Lust came into the picture. Yes, he did. Yeah. Well, that was before him. Oh, that was before him. Yes. Okay. Yes. He and was a porno star driving around in a 55 Bentley with about 10 cases of Lucky Like beer in the back seat and a lot of other little illicit drugs I won't talk about. Uh -huh. And he was a great, great lay. Oh, yeah. That's what was so great, but he was pretty stupid. And he didn't like to drive his Bentley. He drove his, I called it the frog car. You know, Why? Why he was you... very cheap. Oh. Very, very cheap. Oh, okay. He lived on he didn't want to put, he didn't Cornish want to put game gas. hens. And Lucky Light Bear. He oh. was a wacko. Oh, and no champagne? But there's some, no, he, <laughs> no he, champagne. that wasn't of his that mentality. Wasn't, that wasn't no. his mentality. But he was a very, day. very famous porno star. Uh -huh. And he was a great, great lover. And that was it. I didn't want to, I moved him into my house. Uh -huh. How I lost my true love of my life was I moved Antonio into my house, told my boyfriend, lover, ex-husband, that I was moving in with the gay guy, okay? So he said, I want to come up and meet that gay guy. And I said, okay, you can come up and meet him. He walks in, he looks at him, and he goes, Lance? Oh, no. Lance Lust? Oh, my God. Oh, my God! He's gay? He said they flew them to Arizona to do a porno. The husband was boyfriend, husband, uh -huh, whatever uh -huh. it is. What's the difference? Anyway. <laughs> um, he, uh, he said, I did, w they flew us into Arizona, and I okay. did all the makeup for three Girl Scouts that you, you know, got it on with. And um, oh. I say, well, I guess they got their cookies off with him. Okay, so they were, you were busy, he was busy, the other person was busy. So 
these adventures kept on and on and on, on and, and on, on and on. on. And on. But there's something in the book which I laughed at when I, I read it again this morning when it said that Lance Lust ran an orphanage for emotionally disturbed monks. Yes. And also, <laughs> please explain he, that. I'd like to know that, please. Well, I think he was so emotionally disturbed that he couldn't quite explain it, but that was in Tennessee. He came out of a plywood shack in Humboldt, Tennessee, went to West Point, and um, his favorite thing was, you know, a different woman every night, and every climax was like a duller orgasm. Yeah, he got tired of his prey very easily, right? Yes. Wow. He sure did, and I was one of his prey. <laughs> but when I got mad at him, um, I was so angry with him that where we lived in Benedict Canyon, uh -huh. he didn't come home one night and I found a love letter from somebody else. So when he came home, it looked like a garage sale in Benedict Canyon because I loaded all of his clothes on top of his Bentley and threw his answering service, which was his umbilical cord, <laughs> over the cliff. <laughs> Yay, baby. I guess, I guess he was surprised with Don't all of that. Him. Oh, well, oh. he was too, duh. Oh, my. He was a little drunk to be surprised. Oh, my God. Now, tell me the picture. When did, now, I'll get this name wrong, Grimp the Pimp? Gimp the Pimp. Well, yeah, when did he come into well, the Gimp picture? Well, Gimp the Pimp was like the AD. This is fictional. Okay. He was the AD at the studios with the megaphone. That was Gimp the Pimp. Oh, that's what they called him. Y yeah. Okay. That's what but I, I was him. wondering. He was a fictional character that I called Gimp the Pimp. Okay, even though he's fictional, did he do any hanky panky afterwards? I mean, off the well, set? Well, he grabbed or? a lot of asses, if that's what you mean. <laughs> uh, yeah, something that's what I meant. Right. But uh, on the set, it was pretty busy, I would say, right? Pretty Besides busy. Besides uh, acting and everything else going on on the ha hanky panky. And oh, by the way, she was a stunt girl, and she's an actress, too. Elisa, I have to bring that up. But there's a funny stunt that she did. I'd like for you to just tell them something about it. Did you say fun? fun? It, well, I know to you, but I'm sorry. Well, you told me I, that was, I had a laugh at okay, it. Okay, I was getting it on with Roger, the very famous stuntman. And no last names. No, no, he's okay. not even alive anymore. Oh, he, okay, I think he got buried then. alive, too. Okay. <laughs> but um, we had some very good stunts in the bedroom, like I mentioned, and then he wanted me to do this stunt a movie set, you know, uh -huh. thing. Oh my God, I walked in there and I looked at Raj and with his tobacco stained teeth and guess t-shirt with his bulging biceps. And you know, he was still a good, you know, whatever he yeah, was yeah. for. Yeah. So anyway, I said, you know, I'm afraid of this. He said, sweetheart, all that's gonna happen is three pounds, no, wait a minute, 10 pounds, of silicone snow are going to drop on your luscious body, April Moon. You'll feel like you're going to the moon. And then the director, we lined up all the stump people and all the uh -huh. actors and everything, and he said, when you hear the atomic bomb, put this life tube down your throat and duck immediately and don't breathe the chemicals. So I thought the life tube was going to go up the wrong end, and I panicked, and I dove under. <laughs> And I got buried alive, totally. And then I, they're screaming, body count, body count, April moon, body count. I'm <laughs> they go, don't breathe in the chemicals, you'll die. I had to, I couldn't breathe. So they dragged me out a couple hands. That's when my guardian angel comes into the book. Oh but boy. I won't go into all that. Oh boy. Okay, so they dragged me out of the burial ground and... It was in a church in Switzerland, so the, the, the like bench, the church bench fell on my knee, my right knee, which thank God is okay. Uh -huh. And uh, oh my God, I was half dead. And I you was fell to the ground on concrete, right? Yeah, it was awful. Oh they my thought God. I was dead, and then they went, oh, well, get her up and l let's see if she can do another take. Yeah, that's how they're interested. And I was get so crazy. With the rest. I did another take. Oh, my God. They talked me into it, and then my leg was so screwed up, it was horrible. 
So oh. that's when I kind of started writing. I, I took a little, you know, uh, break from the movie industry. Uh huh. It was horrible. I did a lot of stunts, but that was like really. That, that was, was like Alfred Hitchcock, Stephen King. Oh my God, really? The only thing is Tony Perkins wasn't down there, you know? <laughs> a little, a little outrageous. Tell us, uh, you went to the Polo Lounge, and there's a part of her book, which again is hysterical, because she mentions ovo ovulating? Ovulating oysters. Oysters, yes. Okay, what happened was, this did not happen. Mm. Okay. Uh, I don't remember if it happened at the Polo Lounge, but it happened, I think, at the Biltmore in Santa Barbara where I was with a group of people, and um, the oysters came, and it looked really milky, and one person said, ew, I don't want to put this down my screech. That was Yolanda Washington, the African-American bombshell. And then there was Chelsea Flowers, the English ex-bondage queen, drag queen, and she tasted it, and she went, this is very milky. Is this hollandaise sauce? And I said, we better call over the waiter, you know, right now and uh -huh. say, waiter comes over to the table and he goes, oh, darlings, what we're going to do is we're going to take away the females because the females are ovulating at this time of year, but we'll leave the males for you. <laughs> but I did a lot of reviewing at the Cola Lounge. They really had class. They even paid for my parking on the tip, but I always left a tip because we went through about a million bottles of the Veuve Clicquot and the champagne and the crystal champagne, and we just had fun, you know? You Come were on. the champagne lady. I love it. Of course, it. you called yourself the goddess of vice and fertility. Right. What a title. Right. Whoa. What made you come up with that? Oh, my God. Probably a lot of champagne. <laughs> well, you were into all this exciting vice and everything. I you had never no knew morals. what was happening. Excuse me, what? That's what you have when you have no morals. Uh, let's say you were loose and happy, right? I was loose, baby. Yeah, you were loose. And I was you, a loose, you were frivolous, the time of salacious your life. woman. Yeah. And you love taking those roles. That's why you, you didn't want to be like a character actress. You wanted to be, you wanted to take the roles of whores in there, right? Or ladies of the night? They because paid the money. That's that was for the, the money, money, but you didn't, you found that exciting though. Well, I loved shocking people. I've always liked shocking people. Okay, okay. You know, I even had a few little bondage incidents, which I won't mention now. Let me tell you just a little bit to back up about this young lady who is, um, had a very hard and rough life, but a wonderful life at the same time. Uh, she started off back years ago when she was going with a famous Hollywood celeb, and I'm not going to mention any had names. Had a very good suntan. Oh, she had a very good suntan. And this happened in New York City, and he came to her one day, and he said he didn't want to see her anymore, right? That was it. No more. And she was, you were madly in love with him. Well, he was cheating on me and he stayed out all night. Yeah. And I was very unstable. And she couldn't take it. And she, what did you do? Well, tell the audience. Well, let's happened. say that I was the original cutter. I invented, I mean, all these people are cutters. It's so trendy now, but I'm the one that originated it. So and I cut myself. And what did you do? What? Your wrists or what? I went for the wrists, the ankles, the neck. I, I went for it all. It was oh, just you awful. Went for it all. And, and what? then finally, took a bunch of pills, a bunch of martinis. It was crazy. And I was at a, I was living, uh, you know, on 57th Street, right near the uh, Plaza, Plaza Hotel, Hotel. Uh -huh. and in a walk-up, a cheap walk-up. And so I suddenly panicked when I was bleeding to death and I fell down the stairs and the ambulance came and, and put me in the psych ward, the third floor. And tell them at what hospital? Bellevue. Bellevue oh, in New York City. Through the metal gates. What a The mental out. hospital. It's the top mental hospital. Right. Really. And I asked for an aspirin and they wouldn't even give me an aspirin. They wouldn't give you an aspirin? 
It was horrible. And they sewed up my wrists without an anesthetic, and the nurse was so mean. I said, please, you're really hurting me. Give me an aspirin. And if you don't shut up, this is really going to hurt more. It was horrific. And you were in there how long? Three days. Three days. And then she mentioned to me that she got out with her, what, educated? Educated tongue. Some doctor was walking down the corridor, and I ran in his room, and I said, Doctor, and I let the robe, the white robe, slip to the ground. And let's just say that he was so happy with me that I told him that I would come and give him reruns if he got me out of there. So they called my name on the loudspeaker, gave me some used dress from Bloomingdale's. I walked out of there with bare feet in the rain and hailed a cab oh my God. and came home to that awful man and he just looked at me and said, I had no passion for you. How could you do this to me? Oh you could have ruined my career. But one thing I want to make a note of, you went through that. Like I said, from hell you got out of it, from hell to heaven, but you didn't stop. You moved on. I moved on to, to worse things, to, <laughs> to more escapades. That didn't no, stop I didn't, you. I didn't learn from that. You didn't learn. And how about uh, one, another part of the book where the mortuary came into being, and again, not mentioning names, it was a top Hollywood star, that you were there in the mortuary and they were doing psychedelics in the mortuary. What right? happened was... No names now. No okay. names. Okay. No, no names. names. Okay. What happened was there was a, a Hollywood star that I would, didn't want to see anymore and my girlfriend Chelsea, the English girl, uh, that actually I never met a Chelsea Flowers but I had a girlfriend that was very, you know, plastic very, uh -huh. and she had a bondage parlor in Venice. So that's where I took the, the character of Chelsea Flowers. So anyway, he said, darlings, my darlings, we have to get in our car and we're going to go on a little voyage. Let's get the champagne, the blankets, the acid, the pills, the everything. So we climbed over the fence of Hollywood Forever Cemetery. I think it was that one or it was some Can cemetery. Can we mention that? Did you do that? And mm -hmm. okay. what happened was we lay on the grass and the, you know, and this was Antonio and he said, my darlings, my darlings, I want to protect you forever with my camera. You, I feel so at home with, he, with you girls here. And so he wanted us to lie on different tombstones oh my God. with no clothes on and take pictures. So Chelsea looked at one tombstone and said, beloved father and son. And she went, do you think they have little willies? <laughs> and anyway, that went on from there. And then Chelsea said something like, God, I always rock the room with my outfits, but here I don't have to wear anything. So the next thing I've always had, uh, I always had, 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 had uh -huh. a girl crush. I've had girl crushes, and I had a girl crush on Chelsea. So suddenly we had dropped the acid, and Chelsea and I were kissing, and Antonio felt very let out because, you know, we were on top of tombstones kissing. I mean, didn't you have any fear? I mean, didn't, I mean. No. The, it, no, no fear whatsoever. I mean, you. Not after about two bottles of champagne and acid, nothing. Well, I guess after two bottles of champagne. I know we could have been in the pokey again, right? <laughs> And then we'll get to the Mexican jail. Oh, course. I know. We have we to get to the Mexican jail. We don't want to forget jail. the Mexican jail. But I'm jail. just thinking, when you think of a mortuary, you think, oh, my God, how could you do that? The fear of, you know, it might sound good, but to actually do it, but you just went right ahead. I mean, yeah, yeah well, but you weren't taking the champagne. They could have jumped out of the grave and attacked me like a Stephen King. So anyway, what happened was, okay, go ahead. finally, um, I'm thinking, Okay, what happened is we were in the mortuary and Chelsea and I were kissing and Antonio came up to us and he said, Girls, I don't mind a little competition. Would you consider my balls? <laughs> and that's what happened. 
And then we, you know, had... And that was it. You had your entertainment and you had your night and, and that was that it. That was it. So okay. we, now, we dropped acid and... I want to yeah. ask you, with all of your escapades, all of your adventures and everything, um, you were married... Once? Twice. Twice. Okay. First to Jimmy, at the age of 20, he started wearing lipstick. And Jimmy was really fun. And then oh, okay. there was Patrick. Okay, now Jimmy, and how long were, were you married to Jimmy? For too long. <laughs> too long? Years? A lot of years? About a year because oh. we had the, I wanted to marry him because I owed him money. Oh. He owed me money, excuse me. Oh, okay. And we had a big party with limousines at the Beverly Hills Hotel with two rooms, and it was just fun. It okay. Was, it was just, you know. Like one of those escapades, right? Right. Okay. And then Patrick came in the picture after Jimmy. And that was the big love of my life. That was the big love. But and I made a big mistake. What was your mistake? My mistake was that I was getting bored with Patrick because the girls at the Rainbow called him. I'm going to have a little sip, okay? Oh, you could take a, a little, little sip. Only with that. agua. Okay, take a little sip. Little sip. First of all, I want to ask you before you tell me more. Is Patrick uh, still around today? I don't know. Oh, you don't know. Have you ever thought about him? really at times because a lot of women do think about the loves that they had and wonder I wonder what he's doing I wonder who he's with or anything like that I think about him to the day I eat the escargot in the big worm farm in the ground so I'll he, always think of him okay so what made him more different from the rest besides you enjoyed sexual things with him and everything. There had to be something about Patrick that stood out more so than with he the other men. He was just like, when I met him, he was supposed to be the straight, uh, the kind of straight, hot hung eye candy from Orange County. But then later I found out he was really into coke and he was staying out all night. And I was never into cocaine. I think maybe that's why I survived, you know? I was into a lot of other things, but I didn't like that, and everybody else loved it. And so, basically, what happened with him was I moved the porno star into my guest room because he was kind of like crazy, and I didn't want him in the same room with me. And I'd, he'd have to call me for an appointment when he wanted to watch TV and get drunk and, and have sex. So it was perfect. So I told Patrick... And he went along with that? Yeah. The appointment thing? What did he care? You know? So anyway, Patrick wanted to see... My, I told Patrick I had a gay roommate living in a separate room, yeah. and that was one of the reasons. Right. And he came up to... He said, I want to meet this gay roommate. And he came up and looked at him, and he said, Hey, man. Oh, God. I know you. Oh, I was your makeup artist when they flew you and I to Arizona, and you got it on with three Girl Scouts. Excuse me, honey. Yeah. There's, there's so much in this book. Y you have to get this book. I mean, we could go on and on, and the time is running so short here. There's so much more that I wanted to cover. Um, we did mention the title of the book, which is very important, very important. But I do want to ask you this. Today, regarding your sexuality, uh, what is your preference today? A menage a trois. Menage a trois. Now, if this couldn't take place, uh, is there another man that you would think of, somebody else that would come into the picture that we didn't mention, maybe? Of course. There was a song called Eli's Coming. Oh, Eli's So I, I named my vibrator after Eli. His name is Eli. Elisa, you're fabulous. So are you. You really are. And I've enjoyed this session so much. You're so very did I. entertaining. And I want to tell, they thought Fifty Shades of Grey was something. You just have to get this book. And like I said, it's a romantic uh, porno. And this lady is so nice and has a soul but hilarious at the same time, and she went through all this emotional adventures and everything. She's here to tell us all today. We only got part of it. Get the book, have a good time, and thank you for coming to our show, and always remember Sensational. And thank you for our guest star, Elisa Eaton 
of too old to be a hooker and too young to be a madam, and thank you for e coming today. E-A-T-O-N. E-A-T-O-N. Thank you, and join us again. Ethan Live. Oh, Ethan Live. You've got that book. That's right, it's on the joint. You have the lift between.